So we're ready to start uh, this masterclass. Uh, my name is Indrajit Gupta. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this masterclass on platform PA um, this evening. Um, but before I introduce our panelists, uh, I just wanted to quickly set the context for, our, um, for this session, for this masterclass. Um, we've been doing these masterclasses for the last couple of months. The whole intent is to try and kind of um, bring you thoughtful, stimulating conversations based on uh, useful, interesting themes and research. Um, and the theme for today's masterclass is, uh, is particularly important um, because it's, it's really been part of an entire week of learning uh, that we designed for the Founding Fuel learning community around the theme of future of platform businesses. And the topic for today's masterclass is making sense of understanding platform power, disruption or destruction. Platforms have come to dominate our lives, uh, especially in the last five years. And now that there's increasing worries uh, about the power they wield, uh, their impact on supply ecosystems, as well as the monopolistic kind of tendencies they've, they've uh, exhibited. Um, because supplies have been up in arms, uh, regulators are scratching their head on how to, you know, kind of uh, uh, what sort of policy prescriptions they ought to look at. Uh, even consumers are initially being, after being view, wooed by hefty discounts, are now realizing that their cho choices are actually getting limited. I don't know how many people realize that. All in all, it's not a pretty picture. We have a stellar panel today to really understand this new landscape, um, to try and kind of also understand how leaders and organizations need to re really reorient themselves and how do we compete in this platform era. It's a significant issue. This platform, uh, this masterclass, like the ones before it, are strictly by invitation. Since all of you have chosen to sign up for this masterclass, uh, it is clear that you believe that this theme is useful and relevant uh, and wish We've also shared a curated reading list um, that provides the basic background for the, before the session. I'm hoping you've had a chance to go through it uh, because then we can start at a, with a much better foundation and a better conversation. Uh, we've done all the mandatory checks to ensure that this is a seamless experience for all of you, but there's some basic housekeeping rules that I think would be useful for an orderly masterclass. And I'll just quickly walk you through uh, all of us, except the panel panelists, remain on mute and uh, so that you can hear the panelists clearly and there's no background noise. You'll see the um, instructions on the chat uh, on the chat button. If you click on that chat, chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so uh, as the session rolls on, uh, please use that chat box at the bottom, really to, to you'll see that icon uh, the, at the bottom and key in your questions that, that pop up in your head and keep the questions short and succinct so that we can kind of uh, dive into the questions after the initial discussion is over. And time permitting, we'll, we'll try and take as many questions as possible. Um, so um, if for any reason you're facing any difficulty in either watching or listening to this masterclass, don't be too worried because we are also recording it uh, and we will share uh, a record, a link to the recorded version as well. In case you want to share any bits of this on social media, as, uh, the, the discussion, uh, please use the hashtag uh, FF Masterclass. FF stands for Founding Fuel, FF Masterclass. Uh, so we've already shared the um, background of the panelists, so I don't <coughs> want to take a lot of time to introduce each of them, but Professor Kareem Lakhani joins us from the Harvard Business School in Boston, very bright and early. Um, hi, Karim. How are you? So Karim uh, co-authored an HBR article on managing the hub economy that uh, sounded the first, you know, kind of warning bells on how instead of democratizing the internet economy, online superstars like Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba were turning into monopolies. This was in 2017, if I may add. So Karim and his uh, <coughs> colleague Marco in Yen City uh, have co-authored a new book, Competing in the Age of AI, and it is set for launch in 2020. And uh, Karim has very kindly gifted, uh, agreed to gift a chapter from the book to all of you. So you will 
um, all of you who've kind of shown interest in joining this masterclass. So we will mail you the PDF of that chapter after this masterclass is over. And you'll find that it's a very, very stimulating, interesting book and the chapter sets the context. So hi, Karim, welcome to today's session. Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you and the other panelists as well. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks. Uh, Harish Chawla um, needs no in introduction to the Founding Fuel uh, community. Uh, he's been a prolific writer on the digital economy, the startup economy. Uh, he's a, he's a, both an angel investor as, a, as well as a, as a partner at True North, which is a private equity, a leading private equity firm based in Bombay. Uh, he's also had a stellar career in media and entertainment uh, for many years as, as the group CEO of Network 18 um, and other places as well in the Times Group and elsewhere. So welcome, Harish, to this session. Thanks, Indrajit. Uh, thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Okay. So Vaiti, uh, Vaiti Shwaran, um, uh, welcome to this session, Vaiti. Um, Vaiti is, of course, a pioneer in the Indian e-commerce space. Uh, he was one of the earliest to enter the uh, internet economy uh, back in 1999. Uh, Vaiti, did I get the year right? Uh, yes, so he's, he's, last century. Yes, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Uh, he's considered, therefore, the father of Indian e-commerce. He's an author. He's a serial entrepreneur. On to his next uh, venture as well, uh, which is an interesting line of uh, beverages called Laid uh, Again. Right? Welcome, Vaidhi, from uh, Bangalore. Yeah, thank you for having me here, Indrajit, and great pleasure. Right. So before we start, uh, I have a, a snap poll that we'd like all of you participants in the masterclass to take. It will pop up in your screen first. Um, and we're asking, can we have the, uh, the poll? Say you have it. Uh, it's, it's, we're asking our platforms, the new Frankensteins. You can pick any one. You have to make a choice there. Go ahead. And then we'll play the results very shortly. Everyone's completed. Can we have the results? Ah. So about 36% say that there's need to worry and that there should be immediate regulation. Um, it's interesting. It's kind of evenly split across all three. Um, and uh, uh, this gives us a sense that people are still not sure. Um, there is still no consensus on how we should approach this new beast. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of um, dive into the session where we're trying to really understand um, how platforms have kind of panned out. And I want to start with you, Kareem. Uh, you saw the writing on the wall early in 2017 when you wrote your HBR article uh, titled Managing the Hub Economy with your Harvard colleague, Marco Yancity. Back then, you argued that platforms were you know, kind of taking on a shape and form that we were, um, you know, also becoming somewhat monopolistic in nature. And now that's in 17. Two years later, have things turned out the way that you kind of imagined? Um, uh, so talk to us a little about your journey with platforms and the research that you've done. Is there anything that came across as a surprise in the last two years? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, I, so you know, actually, this journey actually started um, for me uh, in uh, 2013 when Marco and I started a new course in our MBA program called uh, Digital Innovation and Transformation. Uh, we were both coming from different directions. Marco had studied uh, software companies quite a bit. I studied open source software. Um, and, but we saw common streams um, co-occur, which was the, the dynamics of the, the technology industry that we saw unfold between Microsoft and the rest of the software business in the 1990s and the 2000s was also now replicating itself in a whole range of other industries. So it was no longer just about software industry. It was like in entertainment and in, in travel, you name it, the same dynamics were, were coming together. And the dynamics were one where there was a, a large basis for network effects, that the value of the platform grows as more users grow and attracts more users as well. 
Um, and and so as you as you do the ma mathematics of it, it 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 very cleanly shows that in a in a network world that the hubs will emerge. This has been shown by uh, lots of great physicists and sociologists as well. And so we use that insight to say that oh, what's happening is that the entire economy is getting interconnected through these hubs. Um, and both, you know, uh, on the one hand, there is, and I think the, the the poll shows us the 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 different viewpoints. On the one hand, it creates great consumer welfare. Like I love having Google have my email, tell me when I'm going to miss my flight you know, give me directions for, to go from point A to point B. At the same time, I'm worried about the fact that they target me precisely. They know, you know, when, I, when I'm in the bathroom, they know who I'm sleeping with, they know, you know, where I'm going to and so forth. And so all those things are, are sort of creating this tension that we face. I think in the two years since we wrote that piece, um, what we see is that, you know, I think the regulators have woken up, um, they're asking questions. Uh, consumers have woken up and are asking questions, but unfortunately, I don't think we have good answers yet, uh, which makes it, as a scholar, makes it even more interesting, um, pushes the thinking for us. Uh, and I, I am, I'm overall, you know, um, uh, uh, optimist. Like I mean, I think, I think market forces will, will, will plan out. At the same time, we do need to be. Um, uh, uh, awoken to the, the issues at hand and be able to not just be passive consumers, but be demanding customers um, and see what that, how that leads. Sure, sure. Haresh, I wanted to bring you in because we've just kind of published a major essay that you wrote uh, on Monday. Um, and you've talked about this uh, new beast, as it were, um, that's, that's, uh, that we may not have fully understood. Um, um, a bit like the story about the you know, six blind men and the elephant, maybe. Uh, can you help us help understand, help us understand what this beast is about and why we need to take up, sit up and take notice? So, you know, my sense is when you combine, uh, you know, the amount of capital that's become available to companies that have got much more leverage than a regular company, right? The leverage that a software firm has or a network uh, company that's got network effect has is bordering on the infinite. Especially if they're not engaged in any physical transaction and they're just giving you data or managing data back and forth. So when you so what's really happened is that there is the capital level availability multiplied by the leverage availability, um, and the fact that these guys are using uh, the ability to subsidize or cross subsidize other businesses and hurt other businesses. What's coming together, and finally, I think I think the the final, let's say, uh, challenge is coming that they are not stopping at abuse of just economic forces. The consumer, again, is getting involved where, I mean, really, while it looks like, uh, uh, you know, co uh, consumers are getting benefits, of course they are, uh, because the fact is that they're able to, uh, these services are able to provide things at marginal cost. The fact that the switching cost for consumers is so high that they don't know they're getting locked in. And consumers are not, you know, great, rational thinking animals, I mean, that we all know. So the so fact is consumers slip down slopes and these companies provide that slope and data is getting abused. Uh, 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 so, so I think I think the mix that's coming up, which is a combination of uh, fantastic amount of capital, uh, free access and connection with lots of uh, all the people around, I mean, the access that the phone is giving to people. So I think that the mix that we have, what's gone into the, let's say, cauldron, you know, that's where from there dangers arise. So you see, uh, what's happened with Facebook and what they've done with Cambridge Analytica or what Google has been doing, for example, in its decision to not support uh, Trump, for example, and that whole thing came out. So when you see that these companies are able to shape people's minds, forget just attacking my wallet. I understand. I mean, that, and there are many ways that many companies do things that attack my wallet. But to get involved in changing the social fabric of a country, how governments are elected is when on the consumer side, you cross a boundary. On the other side, on the regular monopoly side, the issue is that these guys are hurting new entrants. Google hurts Yelp, for example. There are many, even Apple, for example, in certain cases have, has held a suppressed, let's say, other music platform. So you see that there are forces playing that while it appears these companies are giving consumers choices, actually they're finding a way to suppress choices, both inside the platform itself and from competitors as well. So when you put all of this together, uh, I, I think we all over history have really regulated supply side platforms, right? Supply has been a constraint where uh, that's the pipe that people have been choking. 
uh, and and you and regulators know how to deal with that. But here now there are two challenges here. One is that there is a demand side monopoly, demand side monopoly, and the switching costs are structured in a way that consumers are are stuck. So 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 in a sense we need to come up with a new framework for understanding, uh, reacting, and regulating these firms. No question that uh, you know these have to be in certain cases regulated. Uh, uh, yes, market forces will keep emerging because uh, there are uh, you know the entry barriers. Naturally, in technology, are low. So, for every Amazon, there is a Shopify, for example, which is bring down, bringing down the cost of entry for new merchants to essentially set up their own shops. But there are many factors at play, and I, and I, I have enumerated three, four of them, and we have to carefully watch how this evolves. So, I don't think any economy or any uh, uh, nation can allow this to go on. There's already uh, the privacy issues arise, surveillance issues are arising. uh we we already have a technology and the ai battle between governments going on right uh, and and india is really uh, it has a lot of to thing to catch up we're much behind china and us there so I, i think the whole issue is an economic market issue a social issue and how these companies can transform and control our behavior so i, I think sure. i put all the issues on the table now you sure. can take it <laughs> sure well, i think you heard uh, karim talk about uh, i think network effects and the whole increasing returns um phenomena as well that kind of drove uh, the microsofts of the world uh, in a different era you also heard a rash lay out uh, his his kind of point of view from your perch uh, in in bangalore describe for us uh, what you're seeing as the defining trends in terms of how platforms are changing the business landscape yeah you know so first uh, indrajit thanks for having me here it's a great pleasure sure. no i have seen this uh, marketplace evolve over the last 20 years have been active participant for most of those 20 years and you know i agree with most of the points that harish uh, mentioned except one area where uh, i'm disagreeing with him where he said the switching costs are very high for consumers actually i think it's probably the other way around i think what's happening is many of these marketplaces um have realized and i think the challenge for all of us who are trying to look at it in a very neutral manner is the marketplaces have realized this earlier than consumers that actually switching costs are low and because switching costs are low and like he mentioned there's so much of capital that's gone into it the fact of the matter is they're all building a structure that could simply collapse by having consumer switch so i think what they have done is they've used an attempt to monopolize and dominate the consumer's wallet and other parts of their life to make switching costs high so you know in a sense what harish said is correct the switching costs are high but switching costs are high because they started off by being very low the fact of the matter is oh, we just can't switch and the key thing that you know the strange thing that i find in most of these marketplaces and uh, is that the normal word that you would attach with a domination domination and with monopoly is the fact that consequently they must be profitable uh, unfortunately these people they try to dominate they try to influence they try to everything google of course being an example uh, is uh, an outlier but if you look at certainly the newer marketplaces they're all struggling to actually create value in their fundamental businesses one of the reasons they've gone outside their frame of basic business is because they said can i make switching costs so high can i try and influence other parts of my consumers life so that they don't switch and see if i can try and make money even in the case of amazon we know most of the money comes from somewhere else so even though while they built a very dominant Uh, business in their fundamental approach to the e-commerce market but the fact of the matter is it isn't where the money comes from uber is the other example um, big marketplace huge disrupting force and yet they haven't figured out how to make money google of course because of the fact that they've gone into multiple areas uh, early enough uh, they are trying to make money but you know the way i see this is that i think they all tried to create value in other areas Uh, because they've not been able to make money in their fundamental businesses and because they worried consumers will switch the other part that i found out in all of this is that uh, you know i was uh, i had access to some interesting uh, data charts that i came across some time back 
most of this, if you look at, and you know, again, Google being the one example that doesn't match, but if you take an Amazon or a Lyft or an Uber or anybody else, most of them have a fairly strong non-digital uh, part to their business. So the physical rides of Uber or the physical logistic delivery of Amazon are so high. What they feel, you know, the fundamental principle of these marketplaces is the fact that they must work in a manner that there is efficient utilization of their fleet force, if I may use the word, right through the zero to 24 hours. Now, the chart that I came across is if you took at the zero to 24 hours, break them by hour and the usage of their most expensive asset, which is essentially their fleet, it's actually in significant crescent rows. And, and I think this data probably is now available as a public chart. Uh, most of them have been forced to get into other business because you know they made this big thing saying a marketplace fundamentally is a very efficient utilization of resources. The fact of the matter is that it wasn't very efficient utilizing and therefore they were forced to get into other areas. So most of them got into other areas of businesses, either directly or indirectly, to serve the same customers because they were actually inefficiently utilizing. So the domination has started happening when they tried to make their fleet more efficient. I don't think they've cracked it yet, but the reality is that, you know, even as we get worried about the fact that do we need regulation or do the marketplaces do regulation? What about the data and privacy? I think the marketplaces themselves are trying to figure out where to go because on the one hand, they're now under significant pressure by governments and regulation. On the other hand, they do realize that they build this massive monster out there and it, it's not being utilized efficiently at all for them. So they're also, I think, going through an evolution. My view is that the marketplace that we will see, let's say, or the format of the marketplace that we'll see five years down the line will probably be very different from uh, where we are today. The players may still be the same, but I think the format of those marketplaces are likely to be different than they are today. I mean, that's, that's a very interesting. Like that's an happen. interesting one. Uh, that's an interesting uh, point. Uh, I wanted to just pick up uh, from what you said about this whole cross subsidization model, which Harish also, I think, referred to. I wanted to look at another dimension of it, which is around uh, venture capital. And, and a lot of this has uh, this, this kind of so-called deviant behavior to may have uh, been also linked to in some way to the huge amounts of venture capital that have um, that has moved into support platforms because they sense venture capital, I guess, senses very instinctively what the power that platforms could potentially wield. I'm just curious to know what your sense is, and I'll ask uh, Harish and Karim as well. Uh, what role do you think venture capital has really played in in kind of uh, the, the the kind of disruptive behavior that we're they're often accused of today? Um, you mean the role of venture capitalists are plays in yes, building yes. the marketplace as such? And pushing them towards scale at any cost and the kind of bad behavior or deviant behavior that we are starting to see where they essentially start taking on the a monopolistic kind of business profile. Yeah. So no doubt, I think venture capitalists have driven these marketplaces by supporting them at the early stage they've all tried to back their own winner saying, I expect this horse to win, I expect this horse to win. So they've all said, you know, my horse will win and then they've gone and put lots of money. So there's no question that they've helped them become the big force that they've become uh, over the years. Um, Amazon, again, being an outlier, because I think they did IPO very, very early, especially at a time when venture capital itself was not so much. I think the Ubers of the world are complete. I mean, it's also... It's also a proof of how much the venture capital itself has changed over the last 15 years from the time uh, Amazon IPO till the time Uber IPO in between all those marketplaces have been subsequently driven by VCs. But the earlier case, Amazon was not. I'm not sure how much of the deviant behavior I would directly attribute to the VCs. I think indirectly I would attribute, but I think what they've done is because they've gone and invested so much of money, I think they've all played on the uh, Bruce Willis, last man standing hmm. thing, saying that if I support my horse and my horse run fast, all the other horses will go away. Unfortunately, other horses go. There's always another guy with uh, more money. I mean, that's an unfortunate reality. 
So there's always somebody who's spending more money. So over time, the pressure that the VCs have brought by saying, I put in so much of money, I need to make the returns. And the only way to make returns is to keep pushing the marketplace to grow faster and faster. And the only way that such pressures can be dealt is by showing such behavior. Sure. So I think I wouldn't directly attribute, I would, sure. so to answer the point, I think they push the growth. I wouldn't attribute the deviant behavior directly, but I think indirectly they're pushed it by That's pressurizing for growth, That's saying, Harish. unfortunately, my horse is not the only horse. So, Harish, would you agree with uh, Vaiti's point here? Uh, yes, and you know, I, I, let me put it this way. We are all talking on Zoom right now. <laughs> it's a $20 billion business uh, <laughs> that's been hardly funded uh, too much and has, you know, video conferencing is a 20-year-old piece of uh, technology. So I think what, uh, you know, I think VC money's job is to find innovative models and innovative businesses. So I think that's they're doing their duty because remember, where the source of money also comes from is L who got a lot of money, they want to put a little bit of their capital in high return, high risk uh, uh, investment. So how you can, what they've realized is that once you put a software layer on the world, right, the fact is that you can generate extraordinary value because how you configure a business and how you configure a product, Zoom is a better configured video conferencing service. It's nothing new. At one level, it's nothing new. At another level, the way we're using it is everything is new. You wouldn't trust, would you do this on Polycom? You won't, right? Are there tech companies? They are. So remember, what we are seeing is a is like there is a there is a capability of a firm to do rethink the way a business a model works, rethink the value chain, rethink the customer experience, and re and create a billion dollar company or multi billion dollar company by writing a few pieces of code. That's what Zoom is actually pieces of code written by a a, a small team which very sharply knows what consumers want from the service. So I think that's that's you know therefore I think VC is doing its job to that level that they are getting innovation and they're seeing holes in the market where there are huge inefficiencies where you can drive a wedge. And now, once you know you can drive a wedge, whether you back the number one player, number two player, number three player, the fact is these technology-backed businesses, if configured well, are able to get extraordinary market share for very low capital in that sense and are able to build yeah. brands much faster, build habit much faster if they're done well. So I'm saying execution risks exist. But if executed well, the the return on the capital is infinite virtually. I mean, you get 20, 30, 200, 500 X returns, right? So therefore, they're doing the job. Now, what happens is when you invest such extra amount of capital and you overcapitalize a company, the fact is the company is then aiming for the stars. And what the stars mean in a business, it means that you need, need not, you try and find a way to kill competition. So if somebody's spending, you need to overspend them. Because remember, there is a clock running on these businesses. So therefore, you know, unlike any other offline business, there is this whole high pressure of high cost of capital, low switching costs in the beginning, uh, the hurry to get past the post, to get critical mass. So all those factors come in and play and then behavior starts changing. Founders behave badly because you're just putting half a billion dollars in a 24 year old's hand. Now I'm not saying all 24 year olds are bad, but <laughs> we've seen how some of them have behaved. So I think directly or indirectly, so the way the, way the whole opportunity arises that technology is in a position to disrupt years old business models and, and incumbents cannot react in certain cases. Regulators cannot react in certain cases. Yesterday, if you see what Uber is doing in its own, we are a technology company, therefore don't regulate us like a cab business. So you're now giving a free ride. I mean, if, imagine tomorrow, if the same banking capabilities are available to all wallets in India and all wallets in the US, the banks would get destroyed. So there, are, there, is, there is a open door in regulatory frameworks in the consumer's ability willingness to give up uh, supply data and get locked in in a manner uh, is available so why not i mean if you look at it from their perspective it's a perfect uh, hunting so, ground so if i may add um this is such a, such a fascinating discussion um i'm loving it so thank you again for organizing it <laughs> I, I want to I just want to reflect on a couple of points that Vethi and harash made as well so i think i think Vethi really laid out the point that um, profits in these businesses are bimodal, right? Either you see lots of profits or you see massive losses. Whenever I see massive losses, I think, great, consumers are being subsidized by my pension funds, right? Much of the fuel that that's behind the growth of these platforms has been through either, you know, um, pension funds or through sovereign wealth funds and so on and so forth, right? 
And so when you see profits go by model like this, you go, okay, like uh, uh, some, some services be being provided at below cost. So, hey, like as a consumer, I'm really happy that Uber is going to discount the hell out of this and so forth, at least in the short term, <laughs> right? So just so I'm, I'm putting that on. Right. But I think, I think the point that we should understand is that not all marketplaces are built the same, right? Just because you're a marketplace and you have some network effects doesn't mean that you can have low or high switching costs. I think, I think founders, VCs, um, investors have confused a marketplace and network effects with assuming that everything is going to have, you know, returns to scale or that switching costs will be low. So like Uber's story and Lyft in the US and Ola in India shows you that in fact, you can have competition and you can actually fight against sort of these growing scale businesses that Uber thought it was, right? Look at the disaster that WeWork has become, right? WeWork thought that a leasing business was a was an increasing returns business, and leasing businesses are not increasing returns businesses, right? But that's like I think just because, as Harish has said so so clearly, you add a software layer on top doesn't mean that you will get a marketplace with increasing returns. So I think we should be clear about that and 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 really understand that. The other thing I would sort of say is that I'm really torn. With, with this view that we have that somehow regulators can help us. Um, I don't know what the state of, of Indian regulators are, but certainly in the US, you know, I, I would be very reluctant to give over too much power to the regulators. Now there's a, there, the regulator, regulatory pressure is good for companies. It makes them behave well, but I don't know if I want regulators to pick winners or losers in the, in the economy. Like for example, incumbents, are at risk, of course. Well, maybe that's a good thing. Like maybe we want those companies to finish off and new companies to emerge because if incumbents are at risk, why should we subsidize their bad management and their bad businesses, right? Maybe they mm -hmm. should adapt. Like the fact that the retail landscape in the US is in turmoil, maybe in the end is a good thing that you know new, new people are, will, will emerge. We as society have to figure out how we transition the workers and so on and so forth. But maybe in the long run, it's better that there is all this, um, all this tension here. So I, I'm always worried that, you know, if we um, support incumbents too much, right, then we're basically doing corporate welfare, right? We're just basically right. saying, you know, we need to just transfer the profits over to those guys. So I think I'm, I'm really torn about the role of regulation um, that, uh, that comes through. Uh, and, and the, you know, the capital of course is needed to for us to launch these enterprises, these risky enterprises, most of these enterprises, sure. most of these platforms fail, right? That's yes. that's a known fact, right? And what you see win are those that can get through the selection pressures and succeed. And so I think I think this is this is going to be an ongoing debate that we see in front of us for quite some time. But Karim, one last question before we move on to the next segment, which is around the name that keeps popping up in every conversation, Amazon, as they steamroll from one business to the other. What has it done to the way that you kind of today teach strategy and leadership in the classroom at Harvard? Yeah, so uh, look, uh, you know, the, uh, you know um, the book uh, that we've written, yeah. uh, you know, features Amazon, of course, features all the big tech giants. Um, the way we think about this is that a business has two components, a, a business model and an operating model. But, uh, a business model is how you create value and how you capture value. Okay, those are two distinct yeah. activities. And the operating yeah. model is uh, how about you achieve scale, how you serve more and more customers, how you achieve scope, how you serve them with different products and services, and how you learn. And in many ways, Amazon has written a brand new playbook of using both a platform and a marketplace and data analytics to massively increase scale, massively increase scope, and also become a learning organization. Um, and so when, when we hear about these companies entering into uh, ancillary marketplaces, it's because they have the data and they have a mission to expand scope. Um, Scope expansion has always been some things that companies have done, but this expanded scope within very narrowly defined verticals, you know, almost like the, the Tom Peters uh, from the 1970s, you know, stick to your knitting world. I think the Chinese giants and Amazon have showed that you can actually expand scope with cu customers based on the data you have. And the interesting thing about the scope expansion is as follows. Like, for example, uh, Facebook makes no money from WhatsApp, right? WhatsApp has killed the telecoms, you know, messaging business, 
right? The billions of dollars that they made, you know, it would, they would charge me a dollar per message for God's sakes, right? And so, so it's not as if what Facebook thinks of WhatsApp, uh, sorry, WhatsApp thinks of telcos as a competitor. They're not even on their radar like this. They're in very different businesses and Facebook can say, I can provide this, this connectivity service because that's what we are, right? And the, the casualty will be the telco's profits, but maybe that's a good thing, right? Uh, and we get this, uh, this free service come through, but the scope expansion is saying, I can learn about consumers and I can provide them with additional services that will make my platform stickier, which goes back to Reiki's point that we wanna make the platform stickier because we don't have other ways to prevent people from switching platforms. So you add more and more services for them, it makes it stickier, and then you have one or another value capture model that brings it, that, that makes it work. And certainly, as we discussed, Amazon makes very low margins on their retail business, right? One, two, three percent. All their margins coming from the ancillary businesses that come from basically AWS. Uh, and, and AWS has been where, where all the profits have come from. Amazon has always reinvested all their profits back into their retail, retail operations. So, so I, I think, I think Amazon is a, you know, and I think there was an article recently that showed that, uh, you know, Amazon is the new GE, right? GE used to create new business leaders for American companies and Amazon is now doing the same thing in this century. Uh, and so I think, I think, I think, I think there's a lot to learn from them. There's a lot to also push back on them as well. <laughs> Uh, but it's going to be an ongoing debate in society about the, both the benefits of these platforms and the costs they, they impose for us. Right. Before we move to the next section, uh, Karim, there's a question for you from Vivek Kelkar, and he wants to know your point on scope uh, expansion. Isn't that simply about the new playbook you speak of, the new dynamics of competition that have arisen because of technology? No, I mean, you know, Al Chandler, uh, who's a, a faculty member here at HBS, um, he's passed away now, won a Pulitzer Prize for a book that he wrote in the 60s called Scale and Scope, where he defined what a business does. The business thinks about in increasing scale and increasing scope, right? So if you think about, again, I'm going to give the US example, Sears. Sears was the original Amazon, right? You could buy the Sears catalog, you get the Sears catalog, and have every single product you ever wanted. That's what Amazon has done. But Amazon has done beyond just the physical products that it sells. It says, well, you also probably want entertainment and, and, and information products, right? You want a different way to interact with us. So we'll put, you know, uh, Alexa in your household and have smart speakers in your household. You know, you want content consumption. So, so, so scope expansion has always been part of how businesses thought of themselves. I think uh, as Rebecca is saying, technology enables you, and if you're smart enough to massively expand scope, with the same customer base, right? You say, okay, now that I observe you, I see you, I can potentially offer you new additional things. And that because I have more data about you, I can customize those offerings in ways that others cannot be able to do that. Right, right, thank you for that. There are quite a few questions that have come in. We will take them as we kind of move along to the different sections. Um, so we'll move, quickly move to the next section, which is India and the world. Uh, the whole idea is to really see if India is moving at a slightly different uh, path compared to what we're seeing in developed markets like the US and whether you need a different playbook for uh, a market like India. Um, so we just take a quick poll. Uh, can we have the poll next poll up, please? Okay, there you have it. We're asking, will the evolution of global tech platforms in India be somewhat different from that of develop of the developed world go ahead and take your stab at it and we'll see the results in a few seconds okay can we have the results That's interesting. So 51% more or large majority feel that there are fundamental differences in the way that India is kind of evolving as a market um, and responding to global platforms. 32% say it's more or less the same path. So Harish, uh, can you kind of help us interpret these results and, and based on what you're seeing uh, in India, how is the India picture really different from that of the US? And is the fear of monopolies being created here somewhat overhyped? 
I think, uh, you know, uh, and I've been writing about all this for a while, for the last few years, that India, you know, I think India is extremely unique, uh, you know, uh, at, at multiple levels now, uh, especially after the launch of Jio and the drop in the telecom prices. So, uh, first of all, India is not a homogeneous market at all. I mean, you cannot compare it to the US at all. Uh, secondly, uh, what has really happened is, you know, incumbents also haven't had history in India. So, you know, several markets were in their stage of disruption that was ongoing. So you have uh, a lot of modern companies, for example, in the financial space, you know, insurance got deregulated a few years ago. Our stock markets got digitized. So therefore, there is an interesting, so whatever has happened in any other market in the world over, let's say, 50 years happened in India over 10. So I, I, it's very difficult to predict how it happens, but I'll tell you what the playground looks like. So it's a mobile first market that China is. So it's unlike the US in that uh, aspect completely. I think there are many more things to learn from China than from the US. Then you come back to the spending capacity. It's marginal compared to the other markets we are, we are discussing here. So there is only 100 million uh, Indians uh, at the top who really have spending capacity, capacity to transact over the internet. The rest of us, I mean, the rest of India, which has got the smartphone access is available, is really internet consumers. They consume from the internet. It's almost like a TV for them. And therefore, the way this market will play out has got multiple factors. You have clearly, you know, investors excited because this is the last bastion in the sense where you can land and build a large internet business because you've got a billion and a half people. Uh, English is the primary language. Uh, as software engineers are available data and smartphones are proliferating and are dirt cheap. So the driving factors are massive, but the spending capacity is completely limited. And lastly, I think one of the things that's happening, we are seeing the government also set up a public digital bedrock. So when you put all of this together, there is no way this will evolve either like China or the US. That's a given. Because, you know, okay. there is a certain, you'll have to, each segment will play a bit differently. Uh, and I, I know, I, and you'll find that even platforms. I, I wonder which platform will actually serve a person who's in a village and serve a person living in a high-rise in Mumbai. You know, the the consumption habits, the ability to pay, the the kind of content they consume as well. I mean, even today, uh, between some folks watching Netflix um, and then uh, suddenly, for uh, you know, what the consumption uh, thing that's going on in the uh, small towns in India is completely different. It looks like there is one OTT play, but like in the, again, I'll give you the OTT example. In the US, the cable bill was $50 roughly, and Netflix came in at eight or $10. In India, the cable bill is three or $4. How will the OTT guys try and monetize? So I think from every aspect of monetization, affordability, um, the public uh, digital bedrock, and the fact that behaviors uh, are so heterogeneous and so differentiated at these levels of uh, our economy, that uh, it'll evolve very differently. Uh, well, see, uh, that's how things will play out in each segment, sure, but yeah, sure, that, that's something sure, else you sure, guys should discuss. Sure. Sure. Well, I think uh, there's a view that platforms, and I do believe there's merit, that platforms could help us quickly expand into, expand commerce into our smaller towns and help develop, also help develop supplier bases that can, were able to access much bigger markets, right? Uh, like Alibaba did in, let's say, rural China. Are you kind of equally optimistic about that? Um, and love to hear what your thoughts are. Um, Rathi, are you there? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I'm here. So, sure. yeah, I, you know, I think they will, um, they will certainly help in develop. So the first thing, if you look at smaller towns, as opposed to the large cities, I think there the reality in India is if you look at the supplier base that we have on these marketplaces, the top 20 cities as opposed to the next 100, the reality is the marketplaces started by getting most of the suppliers from the top 20. But the real market will come only when you go to the next 100. And you know one of the key points that Harish made is that these markets are India's not a homogeneous market at all. I think the reality is even the suppliers in that sense are not homogeneous. They're totally different. Uh, one of the uniqueness of India is that uh, there are at least, and I can think of at least 20, 25 small towns, each of them having their own unique product and service that unfortunately gets restricted to the same town. And there's only word of mouth. So you have the, you have the Chivda from Pune or you have the 
uh, lock from Dindigal, to give you two examples, and there are so many of them. I think marketplaces like this will allow them to reach out to consumers, obviously all over India and potentially across the world. So I think they will do a lot more uh, for developing the marketplace. The risk, the worry that I would have is, will they do it in a manner that is equitable and fair? In other words, while you will allow the uh, suppliers to access this marketplace, at what price? So, you know, the reality is you have a business that is small, perhaps not growing at the rapid play at the pace that you want. And then you suddenly have access to all these customers. But I think initially, while it will be tempting, the cost of accessing those customers to those marketplaces may be very, very high for those suppliers. So, uh, you know, if I had to balance on, on balance, I would say, yet they would do it. But I would be really worried and I would see on, at what cost they would do it. Will it make sense at the end for the small suppliers to access this marketplace and reach out to customers? Or, you know, while it's a wrong thing to say where they're really better off in having a small business earlier. I, I'm not sure of the answer. I think they'll play out. Sure. At this time, the short answer is I think they will support, but I would keep a close eye on it. Sure. Karim, uh, you have the advantage of a bird's eye view sitting where you are. Um, because uh, there's, I'm sure you hear this again and again that our market is different. Uh, you know, uh, is it is it the case? I mean, what's what's your? I know you know China is very different in, in terms of the stage of evolution compared to the U.S. But is, is can India really claim to be completely different in terms of the way global tech platforms evolve here and marketplaces evolve here? What's yeah, your sense? Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, no, look, I think um, I, I, I find, you know, I, I teach a lot of executives and different companies from around the world and every, every industry and every company thinks that they're the special snowflake. Like, you know, uh, that we're so different there. Like, yeah, the patterns you see here, they don't apply to us because our industry, our particular business, our customers are so special that this, this will never apply to us. Uh, but that being said, um, I, I look, I, you know, as I think about the future, we're not going to be, in a world where there'd be less platforms, there'd be less data, there'd be less technology, right? Like we're, all of us are marching in this direction. Like, you know, the, the mobile first world that India is in, uh, that's gonna continue. We're not gonna go back to rotary phones and analog connections. Um, you know, o OTT is gonna survive and, and find a way to come through. Uh, so there'll be, you know, so more platforms, more data, more analytics are, are what's gonna be driving the, the base of the economy the base of how we create companies. Um, I think actually what Harish said was very interesting, which is, you know, there's about hundred million that are sort of almost like Western developed countries. And then there is the rest of India, the 1.3 billion that are not like that. That's a huge opportunity for Indians. Like that's amazing. Like you, you, you know, what we know from innovation is that constraints drive innovation. So you have a constrained market and we hope that the institutional infrastructure in terms of funding, risk taking, creating businesses can figure out a way to respond and make money at, the, at, this, at this constrained environment. As Harry as said, like, you know, you can't imagine Netflix charging 12 bucks a month in India, right? They have to figure out a, a different basis for monetization in a different way. So I think for, as a scholar, I go, that's amazing. Like, like we're gonna see lots of innovation in business models and operating models emerge in India if they're allowed to emerge. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's like, for me, that's like, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I would add that the, the, the real challenge I think is gonna be capacity building, right? Like how do we get the small businesses in the next 20 towns uh, to be able to compete uh, and participate in both the Indian wide economy, but then also the global economy. I just had a very interesting experience. You know, I bought these new uh, iPad Pros, right, in my in my in my ears, um, and I was at the Apple store in in Cambridge, and I said, you know, like, do you have like the? I'm I'm sure I'm going to lose this, but I'm also going to like <laughs> destroy the case, right? So like, I want a case cover. Right. They go, well, no, we don't have the case cover yet in our retail store, but go to Amazon, go check on Amazon. <laughs> So this is Apple store employee right. saying, go check on Amazon. I go check on Amazon okay. and like this, this just got introduced a month ago and there's like 70 Chinese companies trying to sell me a case right, for this right. with all these funny names and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, wow, like they've already figured out how to create products and they will ship me directly from China to, to, to Cambridge, Massachusetts, which mm -hmm. is crazy. 
right? So, so they have, the Chinese have built up, thanks to Alibaba, thanks to sort of the, the ways in which they've brought the offline economy online, to allow all these small companies to compete in a global marketplace. And as Vaiti said, we need to be able to build the capacity uh, in Indian businesses at all levels to be able to plug into platforms, compete on multiple platforms, and succeed both serving the Indian market, but also the global market as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I mean, we don't know, as Harris says, we don't know the exact shape. It'll be a different shape, uh, probably more like China than like the US for sure. Um, uh, but I actually think that the, the economic constraints should actually drive a lot of innovation. Super, super. So I'll quickly now move on to the next section, uh, which is really around uh, incumbents and platforms. And I think this is a very important section because, uh, um, and, and I think uh, how traditional firms deal with the challenge from tech platforms and how incumbents should think about their strategic response and what's really holding them back is something which we'd uh, hope to discuss. So first, a poll, um, and let's see, uh, just watch your screens, it'll pop up now. Um, okay, there you have it. Can traditional firms deal with the challenge from tech platforms? Let's see where you stand. And I can tell you, we ran the same poll uh, this morning on Twitter. The results weren't very encouraging, but let's see how this pans out here. Okay, shall we look at the results? More or, less, more or less again in line with what we saw on social as well. Very large percentage say that they'll struggle. Um, and I think uh, only about 36% say that they have what it takes to drive them kind of changes that, that are required for them to compete. Um, and I think there was a question from Samiran uh, around this as well, where he talked about large, I don't have the question right in front of me, but I think it was, I'll paraphrase it. It was really around large Indian conglomerates and how they've proved to be uh, quite uh, not particularly nimble in kind of responding to uh, marketplaces and, and creating some of their own. So uh, Vaithi, uh, what's your take when you look around uh, the country how many incumbents uh, do you see who see the who clearly see the writing on the wall that they need to change and change fast? And I'd like Harish to then pitch in as well. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, over the last uh, few years, I've also, uh, in a sense, consulted with some of these large companies wanting to compete with the Amazons of the world, and also. So, so to answer your short question, how many? of them are seeing the writing on the wall. I think the answer is all, but I would add a writer. I think they're refusing to read the writing. So they can see the writing, <laughs> okay. but they're refusing to read it. Uh, and I think that's a big challenge. Um, okay. I'm actually surprised. Okay, I'm not surprised by the poll results, but you know, uh, it's my natural optimism as an entrepreneur. My response to that poll have been, yes, I think for sure they'll be able to compete, right? Uh, the fact is they have to make Obviously, they make changes, but to simply say that they will not be able to compete at all with the platform, I think, is to uh, give up the game before it starts, right? Um, yeah. And I'll tell you one very something that I've noticed uh, as a one example. You know, in the mid '90s to the late '90s and the early 2000s, the when Amazon was just building, I think the theme of their entire story was that us versus them. And I'm, when I'm saying them, I'm saying the offline retailers. So the theme that they said is online is the way to go. Online will kill, kill offline and you're either shopping with us or you're shopping with them. And you know, in a sense, they tried to create the divide. I think they were very smart enough to realize that the assets that are available with offline retailers were actually extremely strong assets built over the years. And a small company in, and in 90s, Amazon was the incumbent that's in the small startup trying to compete with the big daddies of offline retailers. And they realized they did not have what it takes to compete successfully with them. So on the one hand, today we can look back and say, I think they competed using technology. 
But my view over the last few several years has been that I don't think they use technology to compete. I mean, obviously they use technology to compete, they build selection, they build pricing, but I think strategically they used a narrative to compete. And the narrative that they used to compete is that I have all the new assets using technology, all your current assets, which were asset, the warehouses and the stores are actually become liabilities. It took 10 years for the offline retailers to figure out that they were actually sold a dummy here. And 10 mm. years later, they realized actually the assets we had were not liabilities, they've been assets and said, okay, can we start using those assets they are not liabilities and we start integrating them. We actually can compete and compete well and compete better with Amazon. And then they started in the game, but they started 10 years late. And the 10 years is the head start that Amazon used to nail them down. You know, my, so today, Amazon has now realized that the other side knows that their assets are not liabilities, but actually assets. So they've simply gone and said, now that I have so much of money available, I've got this power, let me simply go and buy those assets. So the whole Fords and the investments in India and other parts of the world are now saying, okay, the other guy has suddenly woken up. I can't push the narrative anymore. And now I need to have the same physical assets because the reality is for them to win in this marketplace, they needed to have this as a so good. The reason I narrated this story is I think sure. at any point of time, it is possible for an incumbent to compete. I think the reality is they have to figure out what they will compete with. Okay. Let me okay. take the other case in India. I'll just take a minute quickly example. If you look sure. at sure. Flipkart in India, right? Flipkart has been there for the last, uh, what now, 12 years, 11, 12 years that they've been around. Uh, it's no longer Flipkart independent, it's part of Walmart. But one common theme that they've had is that they haven't been able to figure out and despite in significant investment, one reason why I should stop at Flipkart instead of Amazon. So, you know, the, the reality is the way to compete with the big platforms or with anybody else, and that's true of any business, is that can I find one reason that I will offer consumers to switch to me instead of that? Nobody has been able to find that out. At best, they've matched. But the problem when you compete with the Amazons of the world is you can't beat them in technology, you can't beat them in selection, you can't beat them in operational excellence. So, the reason why they will struggle, and that's why we go back to the poll is yes, they will struggle. But I think if there is a fourth dimension, I don't know what the answer is. Obviously, if I was knew, knowing the answer, then I would be saying somewhere else. <laughs> but I think there must be a way of competing with this. Otherwise, you can't just give up saying, I'm going to fold up and go home. Uh, and I, I want to close with this physical retail example. Says they, had, they, were, they actually had the assets, but they were listening to the wrong story probably logging on to the wrong video conferences and we're sold a dummy. They woke up very late. So I think if these people are not sleeping, there must be some ways. I don't know what the answer is. Perhaps sure. it's niche market plus sure. small markets plus local market. There must be, you can't say Amazon will kill me anyway. Let me play dead today. You can't do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Now, Harish, this would kind of ring true for you because I remember a session with a you know, South African uh, retail, retail conglomerate in your very office where this Thing that Vaiti is talking about popped up where they didn't know what their strengths were, what their assets yeah. were, and they were trying to ape Amazon. Uh, do you want to take a stab at this? Because uh, if you were to advise the CEO of a large incumbent in India, where would you ask him or her to start? So I, I think first thing is that companies are strange animals. Some of them, when they hit a crisis, they transform. And some of them, when they hit a crisis, they don't. So I, I think the first thing is, I, I think... Uh, uh, to realize that the firm needs to change and change deeply because I, I think fundamentally it's no longer about digitization. I don't think, you know, technology been available to the firm. It's the fact that you're in the digital world. I think, I think everything around the firm has become digital except the firm itself. You talk to incumbents, they still think and work in the same way. Whereas everything has changed. Consumers interact with them differently and their own team, the same managers who use the best apps in the world and or, Take, take the avail the best services from these apps and from Amazons and Flipkart and Swiggies and uh, all these companies don't think that they should provide this service to their customers. So I think I think I think the beginning is this hard realization that every day you have your phone in your hand, which has about two hundred billion dollars worth of R and D happening every day, largely on reworking consumer experience. But it doesn't strike you that your own customer needs to be serviced in the same manner. 
see you when you access access the physical world through the digital world actually it's an inefficient mechanism because you can't see you can't touch so a lot of your senses are not satisfied i've written about it the fact is that the digital firms have to work much harder in creating trust and satisfying a customer so therefore and therefore that's a disadvantage with the technology firms and physical firms and incumbents have that advantage but then you have to figure out how to play that advantage technology is now available to them right uh, let me give an example suppose you are running a large electronics retail business in the city of bombay you can reach and service customers in 2 hours all you should be advertising is a phone number saying if you buy a tv or an air conditioner or a refrigerator for me my service guy will be in your home in 2 hours he'll either repair it or give you a replacement for a while now then please tell me how will amazon which doesn't know where it's shipping from doesn't have a clue who the supplier is doesn't know where how to service you doesn't know how to get the damn thing installed will ever attack you but again we see the incumbent saying okay i will match an online price the customer is not looking for an online price the customer will and then okay that's one so assume you match the online price are you creating lifetime value does the electronic retailer in the city know that who is customer is does he have data what the customer has bought from them does he come up with an exchange plan when he knows the likelihood of the life of the uh, appliance has gone away so i think the way you play to your advantage is very different and i think i think there is a the, the jury is out whether several firms will get it or not because every company is what you get up in the morning and go to office to solve for if you're not solving for these sure. things it's not it's not a question of capability it's just a question of mindset and that fundamental realization that if, and when i talk to companies and management i say it's like a jekyll and hyde situation whole day and <laughs> night in your personal lives you want no uncertainty you want to know where your uber is you know where your consignment is you know uh, want instant access to your bank balance you want everything instantly you want everything frictionless but go into office at 9 am and then you don't think about any of these things so i think i think that's a fundamental issue that can incumbents do it yes they can are the tools available oh absolutely they're available at a much cheaper price consumers are happy to in fact give you know i would believe that digital businesses are at to some extent a disadvantage really because they permanently trying to increase the switching cost they know that competition can come and the switching costs are low consumers don't have relationships you love going to apple store you love going to a mall you love love going to a shop where experience is a good so the ability to deliver experience online is limited experience to deliver experience uh, offline is massive but companies have to play to it um, i i see retailers okay. in india paying their front end staff the least why those are the people who are interacting with customers so while you're thinking about customer lifetime value please tell me why you're not thinking of employee lifetime value if one employee is serving 300 customers why would you want to have attrition in your front line because that right. he's carrying the core 300 lifetimes with him customer lifetime it's an amazing sure. it's a, i think there is a fundamental issue in the way incumbents go into work and think about this whole situation and just by getting an app or getting a what do you call a website is not going to solve the problem the fact is that we have, we mixed up i think a lot of writing has happened online presence and online existence are two different things every firm can have online presence now it's a given you can get in shopify set up a website go to wix set up a website but nothing will happen unless you completely close the loop on experience and those experiences are available no manager has to leave his seat open the phone spend 20 minutes in the apps think what's going on behind the app don't tell me you got your food delivered from swiggy in 23 minutes think about how swiggy <laughs> is doing millions of transactions a day without failure think about the system that have gone behind it can you do the same if you can you'll survive if you don't you should be killed no issue sure 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 aresh i'll i'll just uh, throw this to karim because uh, karim uh, would you be able to kind of pick out one of your favorite examples of incumbent who's been able to kind of respond both strategically and tactically to the platform challenge uh, which would it be and why can you give us a sense yeah look <clears throat> so again a very fascinating conversation i, th- I think i agree with yes. everything harish and uh, rathi yes. said you know the 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 reality is that um uh, I, i i actually don't have a lot of sentimental value for incumbents i'm like you know if you if you're terrible you should go you should die <laughs> you know i'm i'm with harish on okay. you don't deserve to exist you know it's, it's you know is free up the capital give it back to your shareholders and get going <clears throat> 
But let's talk about incumbents that have that have survived. Two that we thought were dead in the tech space, Apple and Microsoft have transformed themselves, right? So if you, there's a famous quote by Michael Dell, when uh, as Apple, uh, as Steve Jobs came back to Apple, he said, what should Steve Jobs do? He said, they should return the money back to the shareholders and shut down Apple because at that time, uh, the, the direct to consumer model was the right model. And Apple was gonna build retail stores for God's sakes in high end shopping malls, right? To do this, it made no sense. But it's exactly what Haresh is saying, right? They innovated on their business model. They innovated on the consumer experience. They said, you know, you, you're gonna send a, 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 a computer for repair. We're gonna build a repair shop, the we call it the Genius Bar, was a repair shop in the, in the store, in the high-end store, right? To change the consumer experience. So I think, uh, you know, like so Apple is a great, great example of a company that transformed itself at the, at the doorstep of death, right, to be able to come, come, come with new value propositions and so on and so forth. Similarly with Microsoft, they lost the mobile war, they were losing uh, on cloud, and then they, you know, I, I, mean, uh, I, I mean, Satya Nadella has been an amazing transformation force for Microsoft to become cloud first, to embrace the, the new model of computing and, and make that change. But I think those are rare examples, right? Most companies, right? As as Vardy said, they 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 read the book, and but we don't know if they actually absorb the book. They may absorb the book, but then they don't want to change, right? The culture change, the organizational change aspect is so difficult, is so gut wrenching that I see, I fear most leaders don't don't pursue that, and there's a reason for it too, is because. As, as Haresh and Rethi were explaining, um, the software layer that is coming across our entire economy, it changes the architecture of the organization, right? It changes the architecture of the organization because now different people have different power, different investments are being made, and you can't take the old architecture and then imagine that the software layer can just stay on that. You'll just become efficient at the old architecture. You need to change the architecture of the organization. But changing the architecture is a gut-wrenching task. And I think most leaders don't want to take on the, the difficulty of that because they're used to working in this way. So, you know, you, we have great examples, Nokia, right? People say Nokia died in the Apple war, right? But Nokia had invented every single thing that Apple did in the iPhone. They had invented themselves, they had all the patents and their, their R&D was almost 10X what Apple was doing, right? They disappeared, right? Kodak. Kodak invented digital photography, but they kept thinking that photography was about, about chemistry and chemical plants and selling you know, uh, film instead of saying that everything is, is gonna be, uh, will have a camera and put together. So we have, you know, Blockbuster you know, had the chance to buy Netflix and they said, no, we are all about making the shopping experience really good in the store and not about uh, what the consumer experience was gonna be. So, so my, my view is that, um, that, that the, the, the big challenge is the architecture change that has to happen with companies with the software layer. I'm afraid to much regret that, that incumbents don't want to change, right? As Raithi was saying, he's talked to many of these folks, they, they read it, but they don't, want to, they don't want to believe it and they don't want to actually make the change happen. Um, and you know, what's interesting is that um, the, the, the tech giants are actually becoming good from going from online to offline. There's a really good book uh, by Ming Zeng uh, called Smart Business, which talks about Alibaba's rise uh, in, in China. I recommend that book highly uh, because he walks through what, what, what Alibaba did to basically digitize and datafy the Chinese economy, right? So on, but a very much an offline economy. So they, in many ways, uh, as Harish says, the, the the tech giants have a big ass. They have to go from online to offline. But it appears that offline to online and changing the consumer experience it appears even more insurmountable for the, for the incumbents, right? Because yeah. they have this Jack, I love this Jack and Hyde thing. Like they have, you know, I get mad when Uber doesn't show up in two minutes. Like what world are we living in that we're used to now instant transportation service? It, it would take, I'd have to book a car two days in advance to have it pick me up sometime. Now it's like, I get mad if it's not there in two minutes. And, and yet they, the, the same executives 
don't imagine that their consumers have the same expectations now with their businesses and don't want to make that change happen. Because all the executives, again, I think are like, you know, are the special snowflakes. Like our, our consumers, you know, want crappier <laughs> service. Our consumers want to be waiting in time. Our consumers, you know, and so it's, yeah, it's really- Absolutely. <laughs> Exactly. And, and, and what's amazing is that, you know, in every of these companies, there are employees that know that the company is failing. I mean, I, got, yeah. I can't remember which company it was, either Blackberry or Nokia, which told its employees not to use iPhones. Yes. I mean, you have to be crazy to come up with something like that. I mean, it's just amazing that you're actually getting, so I call it willful blindness. It, it's as soon as you join a company, get a visiting card, get a desk, you're actually getting willfully blind to what's happening outside and you drink your Kool-Aid is served in the company water coolers, you know, that's the situation. And so, so this is a, I mean, this is a subject that I think we can just kind of go on and on. It's fascinating. Uh, lovely perspectives coming from all three of you. So the, we'll move uh, on to, somebody yeah, just so. responded. It was Blackberry. Somebody yes. working for Blackberry <laughs> and said, yes. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 we should give, you know, a Nobel prize for business should be awarded to companies that do this. <laughs> okay, so we move to the next uh, the, and the last segment, uh, which is really looking at something that's taken on some worrisome kind of dimensions here in India as well, which is around supplier partnerships with these platforms. Um, and uh, we're asking the question uh, whether, can we have the question, uh, Ramnath? Yeah, there you have it. Can tech platforms ever have win-win long-term partnerships with their suppliers. Take a stab at what you feel. And then we'll quickly look at the results and discuss. Let's have the results. No. 26% say it's inherently a relationship of unequals. Almost 65% believe that it, it could work out to be a win-win relationship if it's steered astutely. So I'll kind of um, come to you, Haresh, because I think um, one of the things that you've talked about in your piece, which is quite frightening, which is really about how merchants can get, you know, in the digital age, be displaced from being a principal to an agent and it's sometimes even hard to gauge whether you're ceding your space to a platform. Um, and I, I, those of you who've read it will know what he's written and I'll just read it out slowly but surely from being an agent of the merchant, the marketplace starts appearing like a principal to customers. People complain about the food to Swiggy, not to the restaurant. Now that's a fundamental reset, Harish. You've been, you know, kind of closely tracking the raging battle between restaurants and Zomato, is there anything at all that the restaurants could do differently? So, see, I'll tell you what, I, I think let's go to the fundamental issues. The moment you have a technology layer over a market, the fact is that the customer's choices, he can get in pixels. So I don't have to, my choice becomes binary. If I had a restaurant in my neighborhood, we're talking about restaurants, so let's take it. And it was walking distance from my house. Now, the experience I get from him, the ambience, the waiter smiles at me, how soon the food comes, how good the food is, there are at least five, seven factors that make, a, make me take a decision to go there. But suddenly when the food is getting delivered home, my experience become binary. Either I enjoyed it or I didn't, right? I mean, therefore that puts merchant at a huge disadvantage, actually, people are running offline, that they, the choice, the competitor is just a few pixels away, right? Uh, and they have lost, remember, as I said, online worlds are at a disadvantage, right? So, so therefore, I believe that merchants will be at a disadvantage because of two things. One is that they lose control over many aspects of experience that they can offer on an online platform, right? They become commoditized immediately. I mean, there's no question. Uh, secondly, platforms also believe that going deeper, becoming vertical is a fantastic advantage. Look at what uh, Amazon has done with batteries. You get Dura sales. Uh, as the top search, uh, the second uh, uh, battery that's available is Amazon Basics, and 90% of the batteries sold are Amazon Basics because they want to sim either the same or similar suppliers. Just change the branding. They have none of the other cost structures that Duracell has to take care of, and they're selling batteries at half the price. So there are these fundamental forces uh, with which we'd have to analyze it. If there is a way uh, for the merchant to, re so, so the other thing I'll say is that eventually. 
all these businesses have started looking like offline players because offline is a place where a company can actually create competitive advantages so you'll find finally amazon wants to tie up with stores or get into stores alibaba got into stores amazon is making out catalogs today so there is this interesting play that we'll see and it will play out differently in different segments retailing will be very different from food food will be different from any other category so you know my sense is that are merchants at a disadvantage yes however my sense is the market is split into extreme either you'll get merchants who offer such great experiences that the customers cut through all the crap that the marketplace throws at them and go straight for that merchant right so there are businesses there are restaurants a great restaurant in any city right you you want to go guru kripa in bombay the, the restaurant in cyan does fantastic online business i don't think it matters people want to go to them domino's fantastic no, example of a company yeah or, or domino's yeah. i mean domino's has figured out how to keep up and pace with these platforms whether it's doordash or whether it's grubhub in the us or whether it's swiggy and zomato in india that uh, it manages to continue growing despite the fact that consumers have uh, many options available it's got its own platform as well so you will find this market going to an extreme either you become a price warrior and you fight and you win and somehow you find a way to get some advantages in your own business uh, either you have a sourcing advantage or or some other kind of advantage that you have or are willing to run at thin margins and therefore run a very tight operation or you are at the other extreme of the marketplace where you are able to deliver super service and and find a way to make sure customers are sticking to you so i think that's the something in the middle Yes, which sorry. should have sorry. not survived in any case which should have probably died over a 3 year period now will die over a 6 month period so that technology sorry. accelerates sorry. the good and the bad so if it's good yeah. you'll have a fantastic you'll get growth your market uh, uh, penetration will go up the geographical area you service goes up customers love you ratings go up everything starts so it's it's a spiral up or spiral down i think i think that's where you'll find that eventually merchants will hurt because if there were 100 merchants in the market there were 20 good ones there were 30 bad ones now there are going to be 70 bad ones so you will find that businesses will hurt the 20 good so, ones will become much larger actually mathi this is something that uh, i'd love you to step in because you're in the in the entrepreneurial mode now with your own business right and i think harish is making the point about increasing commod- the risk of commoditization and the need for sharper differentiation give us a sense from your own experience as you kind of build your business of uh, again beverages of how you're kind of looking at uh, platforms is it is it to really collaborate uh, and compete at the same time uh, how are you kind of approaching it yeah so there are two three things and you know uh, you made the good point about me being in entrepreneur mode so right now i'm currently facing the challenge of how to get my products move faster on platforms like amazon and it's a big struggle um most of these platforms are actually meant very well to sell fast moving products and it's a it's a complete dichotomy of the fact that you know one of the big things that happened 15 years back is uh, the book uh, i think christopher anderson wrote the book of the long tail right about how amazon drives long tail and Uh, any product that you bring in even if it's not a well known brand you actually get a platform to sell the reality is the long tail i mean and you see the graph the reality is that 99% of sales is not the long tail right it's a really short tail and that's because increasingly these platforms have become places where you go and search specifically for a known brand uh, the guru guru kripa restaurant is a place that uh, harish mentioned i mean you go search for it very rarely do people go and say let me search for some chinese restaurant on swiggy i mean i'm sure there are enough people do it so the challenge that small brands like us face is that how do i complete my product and get people to buy ask for my brand instead of say coca cola and obviously i'm i'm just using coca cola more as a reference point because that's an easy thing to type so that's one challenge uh, it's a big thing the second thing that that's happening and uh, you know i'm going to quickly uh, tell you the, one of the reasons why i think it's hard for platforms and the small suppliers the new suppliers to actually have a good relationship between them is the lack of the trust factor i think most of these people moved on to a swiggy or a zomato the restaurant you're discussing restaurant but it could be a small supplier moving to an amazon or a flipkart initially they said okay i'm the small guy having a limited geographical 
consumer base and now I go onto this platform and then the whole world is my oyster, I can sell everywhere. What they've realized is over time, it is an unequal relationship. The worst thing, and this is specifically about the battery example that Hari said, over time they've realized this is platforms have no problem creating the same product or service which they can sell at the private label business. They can drive the traffic where the customers are now eating out of their hand. So anybody who's now building a brand has to compete A, to sell on the platform and B, to sell the products made by the platform. And that's a hard thing to say. I'm happy to go to a platform like Amazon and figure out using my mind, what can I do to make my customer, to make the customer search for my product instead of another competing offline brand. But at some stage, if I'm selling beverages and Amazon is also making a beverage which is similar, fortunately they're not and hopefully they won't, then it becomes an impossible battle to win because you know, it's like, it's like the supply chain and the customer and everybody else being controlled by a single platform. So I think one of the reasons why increasingly you'll see small suppliers protesting going against the platform is that they'll realize that the trust factor is being knocked out of the relationship. And any relationship between a supplier and the platform in this marketplace, which does not have trust as the bedrock, we just won't work. And I think that's the problem they have to solve. I also don't think they are planning to solve that because it's not in their interest to solve the problem. The reality is that so, if there is no Guru Kripa, well, there is another Guru Kripa, right? I mean, you're saying there are enough Guru Kripas out there. I think that's the problem for right. the individual restaurants and the individual suppliers. There's just too many out there, plus private labels will just kill this business. In fact, I think just to complete the point, it is only brands like Coca-Cola, which will actually su su successfully use the platform because it's unlikely that, you know, the good thing about the Cokes and the Pepsis of the world is that people are not buying the product because of the product. People are buying the product because of the name. And it's hard for a platform to actually replicate the name. I mean, if, if they were selling just a cola, they would probably make their own cola. But unfortunately for them, customers are buying the brand. As long as the brand is getting sold, then I think there's still a chance. But if the product is getting sold, then I think there'll be a problem. Platforms will increasingly start dominating those relationships. There are, there are lots of good, I, I think, points that you've made. And I think uh, that's found resonance with a uh, lot of the uh, the comments that are coming in. I wanted uh, Kareem to really uh, come in on a question that I think uh, uh, Dipayan uh, has raised, which is that um, there are two kinds of marketplaces that are emerging, one like Amazon or Swiggy, where it is a marketplace and um, a plus suppliers, whereas others like Airbnb and Uber, which are clear that they don't want to own an asset or, or a supplier. The first model poses more regulatory dilemmas. Any views on which is a better business model? Does the supply model, supply also model have inherent advantages or does it make it less agile? Kareem? Uh, yeah, yeah this, uh, that was a great question yeah. I saw and I was gonna to respond to that as well. Yeah. So thank you for that. Uh, I mean, so let me just take a step, step back. So let's just think, right? Yeah, so your sure. platform typically has two sides, like the consumer side, it tries to aggregate consumers and then merchants or suppliers, right? And it tries to, a platform fundamentally, main task is a matching task. You match, consumer demand with the supplier, uh, uh, with the suppliers that they have, right? And that's, every platform does that, whether that be Airbnb, whether that be Google and so forth, right? Matching is the main function that the supplier does. When you build this kind of, kind of a system, uh, your view of your business model has to shift as well. So, but as I said earlier, a business model is both value creation, how you create value for customers and how you capture value, so value capture. That assumes that the, the value creation task is the task of the company. But in a platform, the value creation comes from the aggregation story of all these merchants, all these suppliers coming on board. So the question of value sharing is now a fundamental view of a business model as well. So now we say that in a platform world, you need to think about value creation, value capture, and also value sharing. And value sharing is to all your suppliers that come through. At the moment, the value sharing story is, is a hot mess, right? It's, it's hmm. arbitrary, right? It's arbitrary. Like why, why, does, uh, why does Uber take 30% of a driver's cut? Uh, you know, why does, um, why does Amazon, uh, why does Apple take 80% sometimes for news publishers? Uh, we don't know. Like there's no, there's no good number of what the right value, what the fair value sharing number is. And I haven't seen that much economic analysis 
to help us understand what the value, sh what the fair value sharing should be. How much is the, the, the platform investing, you know, all those kind of things. But why do we care about value sharing? Because the, the platform relies on this ecosystem. The ecosystem has to have these keystone species that can make sure that everybody benefits from it. And if you start to eat into your supply base, right? In the end, your ecosystem will not be healthy and that's gonna to lead to a downturn. And that's exactly what happened with Microsoft in the 90s. We've seen this movie play, right? When Microsoft kept eating up its ecosystem and kept preventing people from actually participating in the value, value, value creation that they were doing as platform, uh, platform uh, suppliers. So, so I, think, I think value sharing becomes a really important thing. And then the question that Duffian raised is actually important, right? When you are a platform, you are a market maker, you're making the match, right? Should the market maker also be a market participant? All economic analysis would say, bad idea, <laughs> bad idea. That's right. uh, because it changes incentives, it changes incentives, right? And so that's where we see the contrast between Alibaba and, and, uh, and, and Amazon. Amazon is both a market participant and also uh, a, a, market, a market maker as well. Um, and so, so the, the, the response from Amazon is like, well, look, you know, we want the best value for our customers and we think we can provide the best value sometimes and not the random merchant. Right. Right. Again, that's where <laughs> I think regulators will need to have a point of view. But as you said, we've seen this movie play before. Like Walmart um, played the same thing. They squeezed their suppliers. They had their own uh, self-branded products come through as well. And in retail, that's that's the, that's been the game. Like you see, you see, uh, you know, product discovery by by the merchants, uh, by the suppliers, and then you come up with your own branded product uh, and put it out there. So so regulators will need to sort of think about this as not just a platform issue, but a broader retail issue. Should we have, you know, same branded, own branded types of products come through or not on the backs of all this discovery that the merchants are doing? I do want to go back to right. Harish's point too as well, that differentiation will matter, right? Differentiation in a commodity business will matter even more. The brands, Bhati was saying the same thing, the brands will matter more. How you think of the consumer experience will matter. But what we're also seeing, which is so interesting, is that potentially we might see new new models emerge. So like, I think in the US at least, we're seeing dedicated kitchens that just serve the platform, right? So they don't have a restaurant business, they don't have waiters, they don't have a retail footprint, they just Not are kitchens. pumping out meals, yeah. right? And maybe Swiggy is that's also right. doing that in, in India as well. Yes, uh, that's right. But, but that's, that's so interesting. But, but so, so now we see a new format saying, I'm gonna specialize in, in creating cuisines, I'm gonna keep innovating in my, in my menu selection and so on and so forth. And I'll keep, I learn how to optimize the platform and I'm not going to have a retail footprint, which I think is an interesting uh, occurrence. But the bit broader story that I would sort of say is that for platforms, but for the participants in the platforms, having a point of view about value sharing is going to be very important. Yeah, and I'll come in there. I think I think I completely agree with Professor's point. I think I think one of the only factor I'll add there that capital plays a huge role. See, what's happening today is that Uber is charging 30% for a ride. It's actually possible for a couple of engineers to take a couple of million dollars and say we'll charge one dollar per ride. That's it. Because there's no cost to running the software. Uber has built the market. It's got the suppliers organized. It has got the rating system organized. The drivers know how to use the app. The customers know how to use the app. The payment system just put in Stripe and make it work. Even Uber works on Google Maps. It works on Twilio. It works on several other platforms. All of them are available to somebody else. But the fact that the company is sitting with so much cash yes. is the yeah. problem. So you'll find that the cash gives the this small... small see, Walmart's having a private label, but Amazon having a private label on steroids. That's the issue. Yes. You can fight with some. You can fight with somebody who's, you know, is somewhere. You know, competitive advantage can never be equalized. So people will find a way, and and you know, you can create differentiation. But somebody's got capacity to lose infinitely long period of time because of the way its capital table is structured, because of the kind of dollars that are backing it. See, remember that's what the one issue is. A regular conglomerate like GE, right, is uh, uh, you know any company has. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes, go ahead. Please. Yeah. So what I'm saying is when you see a VC-backed company and a regular capital market-backed incumbent, that's when tragedy strikes actually in a way. Mm -hmm. VC money is sitting like a casino game 
I'll play till I win. I'll play tonight. If I lose tonight, I'll continue playing till I get off this table. If I lose, I lose because it's anyway somebody else's money. That's another big issue. The incentive structure is. <laughs> it's my it's my retirement fund. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so, so remember that. So, so I think fundamentally the capital table. You know, you can't be an incumbent and say, okay, I'm going to enter. It's fine. You know, uh, I don't care if I have to uh, sack people tomorrow. So remember, or I don't care about how much money I spend. Uh, there is responsibility. There is uh, uh, stakeholder interest that is very different that an incumbent has to face versus a VC-backed company. This bad behavior of WeWork or any of these companies or Uber uh, CEOs is a fundamental issue of incentives. It, it's gone overboard. So it's capitalism gone, you know, completely nuts with uh, on Viagra. I would say. It. I mean, whatever they've gone nuts with it, <laughs> and therefore bad behavior arising from this whole situation. How do you compete? Actually, really speaking, what is Uber's competitive advantage actually today? Why can't, uh, like Zoom has done today, gone, Polycom couldn't have done this conversation, right? Yeah. Why not a company come up and say, Uber has developed the market, all, all drivers will get one share in the company, they'll be owners of the company, 50% of the company owned by drivers, $1 per ride, and we'll run a server and destroy Uber. Who, but you now need a VC who will back it and that VC will wonder, yes. should I go play in this casino where the tables are stacked against me? I won't. Yes, yes. Hmm. Absolutely. In fact, there was, there was a company, there was a company here in Boston. Uh, uh, Juno, called Fasten. Right? Yeah, Fasten. Oh, Juno. Fasten. Yeah. Okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that, that did that. Like, you know, basically dollar per ride, right? But they couldn't raise enough and they were profitable in each of the markets, but they yeah. couldn't get the money to scale. Exactly. Yeah. So we have a distortion no, going on. You know, that's the big issue. I, I think that distortion capability of capital is now, and, and especially with 2008 and the QE coming in, we are living in a time where, you know, this distortion has gone. Now a decade worth of distortion is playing yeah. out, actually. Now we are in the second decade of this distortion. I mean, it's amazing how, you know, and, and nobody can explain it. So I think all economists can actually go back, go back to school because nobody can explain it. Yeah. How interest rates tend <laughs> to be negative. So that's another conversation yes, again. Yes. <laughs> But that's the reality. Thank goodness that's not my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm quite conscious of the time. Uh, we're, um, you know, we have one more important thing to complete, uh, which is to ask all our participants of this masterclass to provide us feedback uh, right here and now. And we'll keep it transparent so that all of you can see it. If you haven't fared well, you tell us. If you fared well, tell us. And uh, if it's middling quality, tell us as well. So here goes. Please go ahead and rate this session um, in terms of how, whether it's made any difference to you in helping you understand the Power Platform team. Go ahead. There's no refund on the time available, huh, by the way. Unlike <laughs> <Uber Ride. laughs> so we're learning. So I think this is the most important that we get it, hear it directly. Can we have the results? Okay, about more than half uh, said that they're in a better position to really understand the power that put platforms. We, we take that as a positive, but I, I think um, there's still some room for improvement, but I, I think we will have to thank our panelists. Uh, they've done a fantastic uh, job today, uh, you know, kind of walking us through a fairly complex subject, but being able to kind of cover so much of ground in, in an hour and a half. Um, you know, it's really like someone saying Arpit, that it's really been time well spent. Um, so, so thank you again. Uh, we we will continue with this uh, special week uh, as as uh, the, there is another masterclass planned on Friday uh, with Sangeet Paul Chaudhary, um, uh, based in Singapore, uh, who's also an authority on platforms. So log in for that. My colleague uh, N S Ramnath will be in conversation. So those of you interested, please join in. And um, all the stuff that's being kind of shared one every day of the week um, will is valuable, and uh, and it's it's uh, you might find it useful. But thank you, uh, Harish, Karim, Vedi. Really fantastic uh, session. Really appreciate uh, all the time that you've uh, you know all three of you have provided, and the gift particularly from Karim as well and Harish's essay um, uh, that he he's kind of published on Monday. Both help help you know, kind of enrich our conversation and understanding of platforms. Thanks so much.
Thanks, thank you, and I really learned a ton from all thank the panelists you all the, as well. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks all the participants who've taken the trouble to log in. Thank you. Bye.